Państwa bardzo serdecznie w stacji paryskiej Polskiej Akademii Nauk. Vous êtes ici dans un endroit qui me semble très intéressant, pour ne pas dire extraordinaire. Jesteście Państwo tutaj w miejscu, które wydaje mi się nie tylko bardzo interesujące, ale w ogóle wyjątkowe. Au début du XXe siècle, Marcel Proust, par exemple, fréquentait ce lieu. Puis après, il y a 100 ans, il y avait des grands Polonais, des grands noms des Polonais qui étaient là, ici où vous êtes aujourd'hui. C'était entre autres Marie Curie ou un certain Paderewski. En ce moment, à la fin du XXe siècle, il y avait Marcel Proust. Albo wiele osób innych, pośród których starczy wymienić. 100 lat temu była tutaj Maria Kulis, Kłodowska czy Paderewski. Je voulais remercier deux personnes, on va remercier les autres, mais notamment deux personnes qui ont justement contribué à ce grand événement qui est votre colloque, à savoir messieurs les professeurs qui sont là, merci beaucoup. Et encore, madame la docteur, qui est à côté de moi. Chciałbym podziękować tutaj, w tym miejscu, w pierwszej kolejności, obu panom profesorom, którzy tutaj zasiadają, i pani doktor, która stoi obok mnie. C'est l'année de, de collaboration extraordinaire entre la Pologne et la France, l'année exceptionnelle, donc je veux aussi remercier tous ceux qui sont là pour justement euh, renforcer euh, cette euh, collaboration scientifique entre les Polonais et les Français. Jest to rok wyjątkowy, rok nauki polskiej. Chciałem Państwu wszystkim podziękować za to, że wzmacniacie swoją obecnością, swoimi dyskutami, swoimi euh, referatami, dalszymi projektami euh, właśnie tam. Też jestem dla Paola, a Madame la Doktor. I oddaję głos Pani Dear co-organizers, dear guests, uh, my name is Magdalena Seidak and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here today. We are delighted to have you with us during this conference on modeling methods in computer systems, networks and bioinformatics. We know that many of you have traveled long distance to be with us. Thank you for coming. This year we are celebrating the French-Polish scientific year. Today's conference is a perfect example of cooperation between the two countries and our research institutions. We hope that events like this one will strengthen the cooperation even further and we will have more successful events like this one in the future. And before I hand over the voice to Professor Gelembe, I would once again like to say thank you to all the co-organizers, the co-sponsors and everyone who has make this conference possible. Thank you very much. Uh, on a trip that I took 
uh, to Warsaw and had a chance to meet the French cultural uh, counselor there, uh, Christophe Paoli, uh, who is an engineer actually. And uh, he mentioned on that occasion that uh, there was a year being uh, celebrated uh, this year, uh, 2019, for the 100th anniversary of French, Polish scientific and cultural agreements or collaborations. Of course, historically, if you think of Marie Curie, it goes even further, much further than that. But this was a formal, because for a long time, Poland as a state did not exist, so you have to wait for the Senate meeting uh, for Poland to exist as a state, able to sign, before that it was Russia, don't forget. Uh, so uh, for Poland to sign an agreement, collaboration agreements with uh, foreign powers, other powers. So in, I think it was in um, 1919 that, that the agreement was signed after the seventh treaty and has been going on since that time. And this year we are part of the celebrations. Uh, we obtained the uh, patronage in particular of the joint ministries of foreign affairs of Poland and of France uh, for this event. Okay? Uh, the event itself uh, is based on um, contacts with colleagues. It represents the work, the fields that we have developed over the years. But it opens to areas which are adjoining, scientific areas which are adjoining uh, our main field, which is the mathematical modeling of computer systems and networks. That's the main field. But then we open this towards bioinformatics. Uh, one reason that I have worked on bioinformatic models, one reason, but also because uh, my colleagues at the University of Nice, with whom I collaborate, are very active in the field of bioinformatics. And this represents actually a very good uh, extension or collaboration between adjoining fields that use similar methods, uh, comparable methods, so uh, that is the, the scope. And we are very fortunate to have, in addition to Polish, very distinguished Polish speakers, uh, very distinguished French speakers, we have the good fortune to have some friends from America here, uh, and you may have noticed that there are two papers from the US, there's one paper from Greece, two papers from Italy that are being presented. Uh, in the case of, of the American colleagues, there, one of them is a false American or a true Pole. I don't know which, which one I should say. Uh, Professor Szymanski is in fact uh, in the US, but he's also a fellow of the Polish Academy of Sciences. So I thank all these colleagues who are here, I thank uh, my fellow organizers, Tadek Czakorski, Krzysztof Groszta, who did a lot of work for the organization, who's sitting in the back. I thank them for uh, being here and also for doing all, a lot of work. And uh, I'm really grateful to uh, my colleagues for participating and to the students, uh, both uh, Polish and French, who are here. The Polish students have to travel quite a while, quite a, quite a distance. The uh, French students have to come all the way from Versailles and uh, Saint Quentin and whatnot. So, but I'm very grateful to them, and I'm grateful to colleagues who induced, such as Jean-Michel Foucault, who induced the arrival of these students to the meeting because we have to prepare the future. I mean, we can't just do research and tell ourselves what we did before. Now we have to go forward and have young people get involved. Uh, avec cela, je termine. Uh, je remercie donc Tadej Tchaikovsky, je remercie Professor Blochla dans l'organisation, je remercie Magda uh, qui a fait, uh, Dr Sadia, qui a fait un énorme travail d'organisation aussi, je remercie aussi Monsieur le Directeur qui a été vraiment un très fort soutien, très enthousiaste dès notre rencontre, et merci à tous d'être ici, aux étudiants de Versailles et de Pologne surtout, qui ont fait ce voyage long pour nous rejoindre. Alors, à partir de là, je crois qu'on va commencer euh, les présentations. Euh, quelques informations pratiques, rapidement. Les toilettes sont au sous-sol. Ça, c'est toujours utile à savoir. Moins un, j'ai vérifié. Vous descendez, si vous sortez de l'ascenseur, elles sont en face de vous. Euh, ensuite, euh, on va essayer de garder les présentations à euh, 25 minutes. Euh, et certains autres seront plus courts, mais en tout cas, on va essayer de faire des présentations de façon à tenir un programme relativement dense. Euh, il arrive toujours qu'on ait un ou deux absents parmi les conférenciers, ça donne un petit peu d'air à respirer, mais ça ne résout pas tout, totalement le problème. Donc euh, nous avons euh, en début de matinée, euh, donc, dans la matinée, ces quatre conférences, ensuite des conférences qui, qui se succèdent euh, toute la journée. Euh, 
Et puis, comme vous le savez, autour de lui, il y aura donc un déjeuner qui sera servi dans la salle au fond. Et euh, à, après les présentations, en fin d'après-midi, vers euh, 18h, 17 h 18 h on en prendra un verre aussi dans la salle de fond. D'accord I switch to English. So, uh, for those of you who don't have discovered it yet, uh, bathrooms are uh, in the floor minus one. If you take the lift, if you go down two floors, then you will see the bathrooms just across. I went down to check. Uh, it's uh, there. And uh, with respect to the organization, we will try to have 25-minute presentations uh, because our time is fairly tight. You see, we have quite a, quite a program. Lunch will be served in the room in the back. And at the end of the day, around 6 o'clock, there will be a drinks reception in the same place. Okay? I think I finished all the organizational matters. And I passed the microphone to Tadek, who is going to talk a little bit about Professor Tchaikovsky, about the history of this collaboration, which started 40 years ago, practically, in around 1980. I noted here just uh, a few facts uh, and a few names. It is my personal view on uh, our relationships with French uh, colleagues and uh, French uh, friends. Uh, and it is from perspective from one small laboratory uh, in our country, which is not in Warsaw, it's the smallest uh, institute in the Polish Academy of Sciences and Technical Sciences. I say it to say, I don't know the, uh, the numbers, but if you multiply it by the, the number of uh, institutes of Polish Academy of Sciences, and number of uh, universities, it should be quite uh, impressive <coughs> statistics. <yeah. coughs> so, Uh, it's uh, uh, even earlier. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it's even earlier than uh, Errol uh, told. Uh, I, I, I'm here coming back to uh, um, to the foundation of our institute. It was in 1968, and our uh, teacher, our master, not met. Uh, Stefan Mencken, uh, who contributed a lot to Polish science, uh, was graduated uh, in Toulouse. It was in uh, 1960, and uh, it, uh, the, uh, the subject of the thesis was uh, uh, the analysis of uh, trending states in systems with uh, distributed uh, parameters. And uh, he published a number of books in France. Here, there is an example. Le bas de l'automatique, je ne sais pas, 1965. Quand il a établi notre laboratoire, deux éminents personnes étaient venus et ont apporté à nous une sorte de feeling of uh, international cooperation. One was Jean-Charles Gilles, Gilles uh, Mazani. Uh, he is a collaborator of uh, uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, an uh, of research on automatic CELA, uh, ANS, uh, uh, de Paris. Uh, it was uh, somebody of uh, Renaissance character was at the same time uh, uh, a physician, a psychologist. Uh, I cite here this uh, work on our poet Adam Pitskevich. Poet national de Pologne, a titre psychoanalytique, a character logique, chef de l'armée, he's a And the other person who came frequently, uh, was uh, Professor Pierre Pepidal uh, from Toulouse. Uh, then he worked uh, in 
euh, Université de Sciences et Technologie de Lille. Euh, and then we had a, a, a lot of collaboration with this institute. They wrote, for example, uh, two uh, books, uh, cited here, Development Systems, and the Crossroads System Theory, and uh, the other introduction. I've never discovered that the people that have studied data this past many Donc, ce sont les, euh, euh, our rules. Et ici, je viens à ce que j'ai mentionné par erreur. C'est ma main, erreur, mais en Iria, au Campur. Et c'est un peu plus intéressant. Je pionnier, je travaille sur le rôle de l'analyse des systèmes de computer. Networks neutralization of viewing theory uh, in this analysis and then introduce this uh, domain in uh, our institute and, and I was charged to, to develop it. So I, I started also to visit France. I spent uh, uh, one academic year in Israel with Primo Marie. It was a, a marvelous time for me uh, uh, I heard uh, a member of his family and I had uh, a lot of time to prepare my habilitation this time. <coughs> and also the Randall in office uh, here, uh, now in the book, and others. And then I started to uh, be an Eros uh, uh, laboratory and cognitive system experimental and modernization, isn't it? Uh, uh, which was uh, inside the uh, building of the uh, Hedeby Laboratory of the Company. And of course, uh, I met a uh, marvelous uh, people. It was very international laboratory. I would like to cite here that uh, uh, was in charge of many things in the laboratory. And then I started, we started, our group, our institute started to cooperate with uh, uh, former PhD students of Aero. I cited here the, 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 the most distinguished, Jean Michel Poulon, the priest, uh, other side, Ferran Pekerli, Eddie Pellet, Tanez, Turina Pajan, at this time it was uh, EMN, the National Telecommunication, I believe. We have Pekerbin, University of Crete, Guatemala, and Luis Amiguti, who is now uh, in Maros, uh, but at the end of the uh, recovery uh, was. And uh, we made together 10 projects. Pants and RS, so French for Polish uh, projects, uh, also two projects uh, uh, Polonia, so supervised by Foreign Affairs Ministry, and also some other international projects uh, between uh, Slovak, Romania, University. <coughs> and uh, I just cite uh, a few uh, titles of these projects, there were uh, much more. New methods of measuring and performance evaluation of high speed networks, simulation and evaluation of working algorithms, or optical networks, and so on. It was all about uh, uh, modeling and uh, performance evaluation of computer networks. And yesterday evening I counted the uh, publications we had together, it was a uh, 96 uh, conference in Luna. Uh, it is about uh, our institute, but uh, I should mention here some other folks which were involved uh, during this history in, uh, uh, in our collaboration. Many, uh, most of them, Wojciech uh, Salar. I met him in uh, Israel when uh, he was reading a book with error. This, uh, this book was uh, uh, Concurrency Control in Distributed Data Based Systems. Now, Wojciech is in Poznan, uh, he contributed to uh, Krakow Polish School of Information and Communication, 
technologies in Poznan. And then, uh, uh, now he is a professor at the University of Poznan. And he phoned me uh, yesterday evening uh, asking to, to pass his greetings. Uh, he's thinking about our uh, meeting today. In Poznan, in, in this school <coughs> occasion, that I was teaching just uh, an anecdote, uh, the use of CUNA. CUNA was a very useful uh, French uh, program, Dominique Potier. Uh, I used it 20 years or more, uh, and uh, my colleagues also. It was when our models are computational models. So to have results, we, can, we need to, uh, to have a, a software tool. And uh, CUNA was excellent. Uh, so this is a part, a, a past, a, a long history of work in French, uh, I should say. Uh, but we are still uh, going on. Uh, some uh, just mentioned to our Polish colleagues, which are now working uh, in, uh, um, in France. <coughs> Andrzej Duda, former PhD student of Aero, who is now in uh, Grenoble University. And, uh, I have a group team with network protocols and multimedia application. And Joanna Tomasz, my former PhD student, is now uh, in a super professor and also has a position in uh, in OSA. And she provides a, a lot of Brigitte Blanco, Ashton Air, and the PhD uh, were using uh, the same approach. Uh, synchronization of events and micro changes. And most of all, now we have a chance uh, <coughs> to have in our institute Aero, who came uh, to us. He's not only a member of the Polish <coughs> Academy of Sciences, but he's also a member of our institute and he coordinates two European projects. So we have uh, uh, a chance to, to, to work with him. And also, uh, they take care about our research, specialized in intelligence and energy, our networks, and they model. <coughs> so, I shall stop here. These are just few facts uh, I wanted to underline uh, as an introduction to our uh, today meeting. Uh, thank you. The formal uh, aspects are uh, over, and we're moving forward uh, towards the papers, the paper presentations. Um, uh, on a terminé la partie formelle des présentations, c'est de l'introduction. Uh, on va passer maintenant à la présentation uh, de la première communication. Um, I was just wondering if there were questions or comments, because uh, Tadek uh, gave a very uh, interesting historical perspective and I was wondering uh, whether any of you would like to ask questions about this or say something about this. No questions? Okay. Um, uh, I, have, I have a question for Tade. <laughs> um, and of course uh, we had, you know, at the beginning we had uh, uh, Professor Wengerin who came to Paris. He was yes. already closely related to France, to uh, Lille and to Luz. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, had this idea that this field that we were developing was of interest to your institute or to Poland in general. And then he convinced you to, and then a number of people came and visited and so on, and there was productive work with everyone. Yes. Uh, what was at the uh, institute side in Poland? Uh, what w was there some industrial need that was driving this? Was there some other uh, kind of driving motivation that about this field and this work? Most of our academic interest, but also uh, Stefan Mengen uh, was uh, uh, supervising of some uh, so-called national programs of uh, introduction of uh, um, 
small computers, the computers to control the uh, industrial process. And, uh, steel factories uh, and vectors of glass, <coughs> vectors of cement, and so on. And from his point of view, the uh, essential question was the speed or the performance of, 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 of the system. So, uh, get the idea that viewing uh, theory may predict uh, the, the speed, especially if we put priorities to so, uh, customers represented programs, control programs, and there was a hierarchy of uh, uh, the execution. And how to attribute uh, these uh, priorities to have a desired uh, uh, response time of the whole system, which is uh, a real-time system. Uh, so we started with models where uh, sources of customers were uh, just of number one. So each source was just one customer. And we had to do the priorities and looking uh, with, uh, for the response time. And it was my colleague, Adam Boric, who is a professor in uh, Berlin Technical University, and me who started to, uh, to deliver some uh, uh, academic background for, for this uh, project and program. <coughs> Uh, this is very interesting because it's perhaps one element that was missing from the perspective, which is uh, <coughs> the deeper motivation uh, coming yes. from the application areas yes. and so on. Not only Alors, je traduis pour les étudiants uh, qui sont là, les étudiants français qui sont là, vous n'avez peut-être pas com complètement suivi la discussion en anglais. Uh, ma question, la question que j'ai posée à mon collègue, à Tadek, c'était est-ce que, donc, dans cette collaboration, est-ce qu'il y avait une motivation peut-être industriel ou vis -vis du, de, du point de vue applicatif, pour euh, les méthodes euh, que euh, nous étions en train de développer à l'époque à, à Paris, donc dans mon équipe, et pourquoi est-ce que euh, l'équipe polonaise trouvait ça intéressant. Alors il m'a expliqué, il vient de m'expliquer, il vient de nous expliquer qu'en fait, une des motivations, c'était que euh, le directeur du laboratoire de l'époque, qui n'était pas euh, le professeur Tchaikovsky, mais professeur Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky l'a venu à succéder, donc le directeur du labo de l'époque avait un intérêt dans des grands systèmes de contrôle industriel, de commandes industrielles. Et donc on utilisait évidemment des ordinateurs pour activer les commandes et cela euh, nécessitait une analyse de performance pour voir si les programmes qui faisaient le, la commande pouvaient s'exécuter à temps, euh, avec des ressources évidemment limitées puisque les ordinateurs s'occupaient de plusieurs commandes à la fois, c'est-à-dire de flots de commandes. Donc c'est dans ce sens-là qu'il y avait un intérêt. And this brings us, of course, to the Internet of Things, right? So it's uh, exactly the same problems as we deal with the Internet of Things. And uh, some of us very soon will be wired. I mean, we will have electronic uh, pacemakers, electronic fibrillators. Um, uh, we will be robotic. We'll have robotic legs and so on. Uh, there was a very interesting experiment uh, announced uh, just a few days ago in Paris about someone who is using his brain to drive his arms and legs, but through an exoskeleton, an external robot. So we will have these things, and exactly the same problems will arise in uh, more complex and perhaps even more vital circumstances. Thank you, Thank you. So with that, I would like to invite the first speaker. Oops. Delighted that you can join us. You may need the mic. I don't know. Thank you very much for the invitation. 
I'm indebted particularly because I'm a pure mathematician, so this is something extraordinary for me to be in such, uh, such a group. Uh, I s started, I made my PhD in uh, topological dynamics, so probably very far from your interest, but later I became interested in computational aspects of this theory, topological dynamics. The reason was, uh, and I go a little bit in detail in a moment, uh, the, the tools uh, we were uh, at hand for solving problems in differential equations were, you know, differential equations were a great tool behind this technical revolution uh, in the uh, 17th, 18th century. But unfortunately, mathematicians could not contribute too much beyond this concept itself, because in terms of solving the equations, you have to rely on numerical methods. But uh, surprisingly, it turned out that the topological methods may sometimes provide tools for proving the existence of certain solutions of particular features. But analytically, it was very difficult to check the uh, conditions. And we came, came up with a computational rigorous method. So we could somehow prove with the help of computer uh, that certain solution exists. And uh, this brings me now to the probably reason uh, I'm here now. Uh, it turned out that this method also may be of interest when you study what I call data-driven dynamics. So nowadays, uh, we are in the situation where it's, where it's so easy to collect data, to store it. The computers are so fast, the, the storage is so huge. But the problem is how to get some understanding from this data. And uh, topological methods, and there is a huge group of uh, applied mathematicians uh, worldwide now who, who use topological methods in understanding the geometry of data. This is particularly useful when the data is high dimensional, and this is typically the case. But there is less uh, done in terms of combining with, uh, this with uh, dynamic behavior. So here are just a few examples of uh, data uh, uh, in dynamic nature. The top row, these are just examples of data collected from what is called time series, so just records of certain measurements. The, the bottom row are just a few examples of a situation where you have a cloud of points and at this, these points you can physically measure uh, the direction of the expected movement in the nearest future. So this is just the case of uh, sea currents. These are, this is uh, magnetic fields of the sun and this is actually a study of the brain. But uh, anyway, so uh, the question was, would, would it be possible to use this, these methods to understand uh, dynamics uh, given by data? And uh, the question was, how to, was it possible to adapt these uh, topological tools? So this is the question. And one approach uh, tested by many applied mathematicians was just to go back to these differential equations. So use this data to construct a differential equations which are somehow approximates uh, the problem, then solve the differential equation, uh, solve numerical, and just use the, the, the solutions to understand to predict the future. But uh, uh, this has uh, several drawbacks. Uh, let me mention uh, uh, only one: that you start with some degree which is discrete. Uh, and then you write an artificial, open, very artificial, artificial differential equation, and you have to discretize again in a different way just to solve it. So uh, the idea is maybe it's more natural just to try to come up with a concept of dynamics in a purely combinatorial fashion and carry over these topological tools directly to, to this combinatorial setting. So what combinatorial tools do you speak about? Uh, this all has roots in the work of the Krakow mathematician Dajewski. I do not look at uh, this is a slide for mathematicians. Just this picture is important. <coughs> uh, this picture is important here. So the idea of Dajewski was uh, just to understand uh, the. He, he searched for stable uh, solutions. 
or at least bounded solutions of differential equations, and he noticed that sometimes the study what happens at the boundary region may tell you uh, what happens inside. And uh, his observation was that there is, if there is no solution inside, in this case there is one, there is a stationary part here. But if you just remove all the uh, solutions we stay inside, then there is uh, a continuous map from the uh, initial stage to the boundary, which lets you make a topological observation that uh, the whole uh, region may be continuously deformed to the exit set, part here in red. So this is not the case. It's, even if you do not know topology, it's easy to imagine that if you want to transform this square into these two pieces, you have to break it. This will not be continuous. So this lack of continuity actually forces that something must exist inside. Okay, and then again, uh, 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 American mathematician Conley developed the Pazewski ideas into something analytically computable. He came up with the concept of isolating the neighborhood. This is based on the assumption here that the vital for this continuity is the closeness of this exit set. And from that he developed, maybe the figure here, so this is Conley, he developed an index, a topological invariant which when it's non-trivial, it guarantees the existence of bounded solutions, and moreover, if you know the invariant, you can predict the behavior of the solution. Is it attracting or returning or will it be And uh, usually, it turns form of a uh, polynomial. So here are examples. This is the situation. This is just a pure situation of a Lewski theorem. If there is nothing inside, you can just follow the trajectories and deform the whole region to the exit. And this is uh, the, the invariant is zero, the polynomial is zero. But, uh, for instance, if you have a saddle like here, then the invariant is just T. This is just, uh, now you need to know a little bit of topology. Uh, the, the topological invariant of circle is the first homology group, which is non trivial. And this is uh, reflected in this polynomial T here in the uh, first part. So here is the summary of various cases. The point is that these different dynamical situations can have a description in terms just of the polynomial. And from this polynomial, you can just tell, for instance, that you have a, a rotating behavior, or uh, which might be attracting, the polynomial is different. You have a rotating behavior which is rotating, the polynomial is different, and so on. The these points typically are monomials. Okay, so this uh, theory, this Conley theory found in many applications in the study of differential equations, uh, even to prove the existence of chaotic dynamics. But uh, the question, now let me go, okay, the last thing about the theory of the Morse composition, so the global description of dynamics. Uh, so when you have, uh, when you want to have a global understanding, you can study several isolated invariant sets, connections between them, and build a graph, or call the most common graph, where you get these polynomials as labels and this graph, and this is a kind of global description uh, of the dynamics. And the question now is, can we do something similar, but uh, just directly on data? And here the work of Robin Foreman is uh, very useful, and an American mathematician, who at the end of the 20th century studied uh, the question as a pure mathematician. He was not interested in data at all. A uh, very surprising question. He, he asked himself, can I do Morse theory, the, the strongest mathematical tool in the study uh, of connections between topology and dynamics, in purely combinatorial setting? And uh, it turned out it's uh, possible, it's very beautiful, this theory. I will not tell this theory here. The only point is that uh, he came up as a byproduct of, with the concept of combinatorial vector field. So it's a kind of replacement of differential equations in purely combinatorial setting. So his space becomes now a simple complex, a collection of triangles, edges, vertices, in this simplest case, other case. 
This is emphasized here that uh, actually uh, this is a finite collection. I put a white circle in the center of mass of each uh, piece. So for uh, this triangle, this is uh, this circle, for this edge, this is this circle, and so on. And then when you partition this collection of uh, synthesis uh, into singletons, which are corresponding more theory to critical cells and dupletons, uh, between a uh, base of co-dimension one and a triangle like this, you get what he called combinatorial vector And it turns out that, okay, so I'm fine. So there is a modification of this concept, did it just because he was only interested in his in concept to prove the analog of Morse theory, but this is not working well with general dynamics because sometimes when you have to pair, it may happen that you have to pair, for instance, three edges with the same two-dimensional cell. So there is this generalization, which I call combinatorial multivector field, where you are allowed not only to have a partition into singletons, so here is a singleton and a dupletons, but sometimes uh, larger corrections, as long as this is complex in the faucet, defined faucet structure defined by this phase relation. But anyway, uh, uh, the main point is that this whole Conley theory may be carried over to this combinatorial setting. So you still have all these uh, invariants, all these polynomials. Uh, for instance, this is an example now. Again, uh, uh, Conley Morse graph. So there is, for instance, a recurring periodic trajectory here, an attractive periodic trajectory here, uh, a saddle here, uh, an attractive fixed point here, and so on. So you can compute these invariants. And uh, interestingly, uh, you can actually prove, this is what I managed to prove recently to my collaborators, that each such combinatorial vector field <coughs> actually gives rise to a classical dynamical system. So this is not a pure abstract nonsense. This is always related to actual dynamics. OK, and it works. This is just an example, a simple example. When tested this on the dynamics we understand well. So we took just classical uh, Lotka-Bortella equations where the dynam dynamics of the differential equations is well understood. And uh, we were able to find that uh, more set compositions, more sets. OK, so uh, the point is uh, here is the actual differential equations. But instead, we just randomly selected a collection of points in the plane assigned to this to the point a vector just from the differential equations. Here we have this for control this differential equation and then so we constructed the uh, uh, multivector field, computed the Morse uh, decomposition and <coughs> there is uh, this recent method of uh, persistent uh, topology which lets you even look what happens when you gradually modify your uh, grid, for instance, you take more and more points, and then uh, the, the outcome of the computation may differ, but still you can recover those numbers from these parts. But anyway, let me go now to this main example. So, uh, a few years ago, I had the chance to meet uh, Jim Bernal, who taught me uh, the area of his research, where he studies uh, dynamics of genes. And uh, what I learned from this is that, in principle, in theory, uh, there are differential equations to describe these dynamics. But unlike the differential equations written by the physicists, there is very little known about the coefficients in these dynamics. And moreover, the physicists can set up experiments to measure quite precisely the unknown coefficients. Biologists cannot. So they roughly know what the uh, right-hand sides are, and they know that, in principle, there are these sigmoid uh, curves. Uh, and uh, one of the approaches to study the problem, because of the complexity, uh, in principle, you could try to solve many, many differential equations for many, many uh, coefficients, but it's uh, probably too many to just get the idea of what's going on. Instead, to concentrate since the linearities are the sigmoid curves, 
what ma mostly matters is where you have a, a small value or large value. Uh, and then uh, you can just divide the uh, variables into uh, segments where over a segment you can say uh, here over segment zero uh, the uh, uh, control of this variables over the speed of the other variables is the same uh, it's low here <coughs> one is low one is uh, high here both are both are high so this way you divide the uh, space into small pieces by the way uh, these slides are taken <coughs> from the presentation of Giulio Perino uh, give at a conference in uh, Poland in 2016 and then when you have uh, such a division into pieces uh, of these um, uh, variables you can just look uh, from the possible states so once again low 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 high 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 uh, you can just draw these arrows which tell you roughly how the trajectories should move from piece to piece. So these are just two examples, but even in this combination <coughs> there are many, many uh, possible uh, dynamical systems. And I just thought that uh, the methods we developed for this data-driven dynamics might also apply here. Uh, we have to uh, dualize uh, the space. So, uh, in these pictures, what matters are the squares and the edges represents what happens between squares. To fit it to our language, we represent each square by a vertex, so we take a dual representation. Each edge uh, here, a horizontal, this vertical one is represented here by a horizontal edge. Uh, and for instance, we have uh, this uh, horizontal edge is represented here by the vertical edge and so on. And now, let's take this example. Uh, this is uh, uh, Gilles' uh, example, and this is reformulated in the language of this combinatorial multivector fields. And you can look for this Morse decomposition here, uh, and the Morse Conley graph, and this is the Morse Conley graph here for this example. So, for instance, what we see here, this arrow means that in principle you can expect that something will stay inside in this in this square, the same here. So we have two fixed points. This is represented here and here, and these are attractive fixed points. But you see that uh, the dynamics from this square goes to this square, whereas something stays here. So when you understand dynamics, you know that there must be something that separates these two phenomena, and this takes the form of this uh, fixed point here, which is actually a saddle and uh, its uh, position <coughs> in this Morse Conley graph is here, uh, this saddle with the Conley polynomial T, which just tells you that this is a saddle, and the Conley polynomials here are just one, which tells you that these are attracting fixed points. So this is the mm, other example. Uh, here, uh, again, uh, we see this rotating behavior among these squares, which means that actually something maybe must be fixed also here. So we have this uh, repelling fixed point attracting periodic trajectory. And again, for similar reasons as before, a, a fixed point here, we see it here, but also this saddle here around this edge. So this is the more strongly polynomial here. You can notice that this one is not a monomial, uh, and this is just because it corresponds to this uh, periodic trajectory here. Okay, so uh, there are these uh, approaches now which uh, people do for differential equations but also somehow uh, combinatorized where uh, in situations when you cannot tell precisely what the coefficients are, instead they try to do a full database. So just look over a space of parameters, divide the space of parameters into small pieces and then try to classify all possible uh, dynamical behavior over of the whole uh, space of parameters. So actually I asked my student to do something similar for this small space, uh, but still quite interesting. Uh, and uh, he computed all the possible uh, combinatorial dynamical system on this space. So it's easy to count that the space consists of 15 cells, two squares, seven edges, six vertices. 
it's not so obvious to compute that there are 38,450 different combinatorial multivector uh, fields on this space and 266 different Morse colony graphs. Different <coughs> meaning they also differ by label, uh, labels. So uh, not only by the shape of the graph, but also what is at the labels. And this is uh, now the collection of all these 266 uh, Morse Conley graphs, of course, for each, this is not in this figure, for each Morse Conley graph, there is the corresponding uh, collection of, of uh, combinatorial dynamical systems. They are ordered by the statistics. So this <coughs> one is most frequent. So this Morse Conley graph appears in 5,000 something uh, uh, dynamical systems. So this is like the example we have here. So there are 500 examples of this, and so on. So this is his work. And of course, now the question is how to proceed, because this could be a starting point for a database. So somebody knows from the biological experiments that we expect uh, a bistable, uh, for instance, a bistable dynamics. And maybe uh, one uh, is uh, like a fixed point, another one is oscillatory. So then you can search this database and produce all the combinatorial multivector fields which might be responsible for such, uh, for such dynamics. Of course, there is cost in such computations, an exponential cost. So if you want to take a larger uh, space and do the classification, it's probably still possible for maybe four or six squares. This was done on a just average laptop, this computation, just in a few minutes. Yes, I'm just uh, done. So uh, the, the last very uh, comment is that even uh, if uh, there is a problem with this exponential growth, you can still combine the methods uh, Gilles uses just to, uh, when you produce the uh, candidates, uh, you just do the restriction, you do not look for all possible candidates, but just uh, candidates which logically are acceptable and still produce a kind of database. So thanks a lot for your attention here. <laughs> So far, uh, nothing was done, at least from, from my knowledge, in that direction yet. But at least, uh, surprisingly, so many important features really carry over to this combinatorial dynamics that for the moment I'm optimistic. When I started on this, uh, it was uh, a big barrier uh, in understanding this special flavor of topology here, which was a, 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 a obst obstacle which caused uh, that we did not believe that many is possible. But then there was a switch and suddenly it turned out that what is really important so far we managed to carry over. So this is what all what I can say. I think there's another question here. There's a question. There is also there, but let's start. So, uh, okay, if you can talk to me. Yes, so, so, so in principle, uh, you can start with any cloud of points, then use the methods of uh, uh, computational topology to construct a simplicial complex. So for instance, uh, a Rips complex or check complex, and then you can build dynamics <coughs> in this complex. That's the most typical situation. But as you've seen, the uh, example of Gilles is completely different. It just comes from the uh, division into squares of the spells via the uh, places where you have a switch in the values uh, so that you cannot say that uh, it's more or less the same parameter values in this region. 
So there are various ways to do that. But the typical one is just a, a signature complex constructed from out of points from uh, via check complex or rib subplex, something like that. We will take one more question and then we'll have to move forward. What was the other one? <coughs> so I thought you had also a question. Well, I have a question too. <laughs> I'll take the last one. So, uh, Can you ask the microphone? Uh, with respect to uh, the methods you've presented, I would expect that the kind of the primary application area would be automata theory. Uh, because there's such a direct connection. And I was just wondering, has there been an attempt to connect automata theory and structural transition matrices and automata theory and so on to the work that you are describing? That would be definitely very, very interesting, but no, no attempt yet in that direction. I am aware of this connection. And just as a historical comment, this reminds me of the topological uh, relationship, the topological re relationship and automata theory. It re reminds me of work in Grenoble with uh, Yves Robert. Uh, there's a whole school of automata theory in France, which developed in Grenoble, which was looking at the dynamics, essentially the dynamics seeking unit limit cycles and things of that nature for automata. And I think there's a strong connection with All what, what I can say is that I know they uh, use in these areas this topology which are not convenient for typ typical topologies, namely where there is no metric space, no good separation axioms. And this is what happens here. And this is a barrier actually. So that is also a good sign that, that there might be something there too. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. to a second presentation, which is not, I mean, may sound different, but not too far away, uh, Lohr Petrucci, uh, who has worked a lot, Lohr has worked a lot with uh, uh, Poland, she has published quite a few papers with them, and in addition, in fact, this paper, for instance, and in addition, I'd like to mention that Lohr was proposed to speak here uh, by uh, Ferhan Bekanin. Uh, he suggested Lohr. Uh, they're from the same university. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, so this work I'm going to present is issued from a collaboration with a group of uh, Wojtek Pencek uh, and uh, E.P. Pan in Warsaw. Uh, we had several projects and there's an ongoing uh, CNRS Pan project uh, that Tilfil will talk about tomorrow. So we this is um, an earlier work. So this work is about uh, controlling actions and time in parametric timed automata. And it was carried with uh, Wojtek Pencek, Michal Knapik, and Etienne André. Etienne was at, uh, in the same group as I am at University Paris 13. And he just moved to uh, Université de Norraine in Nancy. So um, does that work? Mm. Oh, so, I, sorry, it was switched off. <laughs> uh, okay, so I will present some motivation, then show you what uh, action controllable parametric timed automata are, and how we can do mixed parameter synthesis, and then some applications. Um, so the motivation was to, is to provide a designer with some design choices uh, to support decision making in the system design process where we have time characteristics that might be uh, different. So when you design an electronic system, for example, you could cho choose between uh, different uh, um, hardware and that have different time characteristics and you would like to have something to help you in choosing which hardware you're going to pick for your system. Uh, another thing is that uh, we are interested in enabling and disabling some controllable actions and seeing what is uh, really meaningful there. So cho select choices depending on, for example, component costs and also feasibility. So there's a trade-off between constraints and also the actions that we are going to consider. So let's take a simple example. So I will show you a model here with a small automaton. Uh, 
it's not the actual model that you'll see at the end, but it's just to give you a flavor of what's going on there. Uh, so this is uh, a small uh, example of a thief that wants to steal a treasure in a museum. So initially he is outside uh, the museum and he waits outside. Then he can break the glass, uh, break a window, and it takes some, some time, so at least uh, P time units, um, and the alarm goes on. So when the window is broken, it starts beeping. Uh, then the thief gets inside, he walks the corridor, takes some time as well, so let's say two time units, and he can steal this treasure. Then afterwards he wants to... F uh, to oh yeah, uh, f uh, here's another solution. The other solution is instead of breaking the glass, it's to crawl in the ventilation system, and it takes uh, at least uh, Q time units to get to the treasure room. Um, and then when it steals the treasurer, the alarm starts ringing, right? So it is, as you can see, there are two possible uh, solutions. And the, the concern of the thief there is to say, well, which one am I going to choose? Um, so finally, he wants to run away from the police because the alarm is ringing. And he has a possibility, which is uh, to fly away. He has a buddy who is uh, coming to pick him up with an helicopter. And uh, to fly away takes him uh, three, uh, three time units at least. Or he can choose to uh, go back in ventilation system and crawl again. And it takes the same time as on the way in. Okay. And let's say that it's uh, safe if the alarm has been ringing for less than 15 time units, otherwise the police will show up. So here you, you see that we have both timing aspects. Um, we have also the possibility of doing some actions or choosing some actions or not choosing the action, or choosing another one. Okay, so the problems are um, the problems at stake here are uh, timing problems on the one hand. So under which parameter values p and q? We say breaking the glass that takes at least p time units. Crawling the vent uh, takes at least q time units. So um, under which parameter values p q is this safe location reachable? And this is uh, real parameters that we are considering, real timing parameters. And another possibility is under which parameter values P and Q uh, are, is their location safe reachable? If some of the actions that are take, so break glass, uh, crawl vent, and fly away uh, are disabled, right? For example, uh, it's too co costly to have the helicopter picking you up, so you would like to avoid fly away. And this is uh, uh, some more parameters, so not timing parameters, but action parameters that are booleans. Either they are enabled or they are disabled. So basically, the goal is to build uh, mapping from all the uh, from subsets of uh, controllable actions to real parameter valuations, that is timing valuations, such that these, if these actions are enabled, then our goal, so safe here, is reachable under these valuations. So if, for, uh, if these actions are enabled, then uh, we want to know the parameter, the timing parameter valuations that allow for reaching the goal. And of course, we want to avoid brute force because we can enumerate everything and it takes ages and this is not good, if possible. <laughs> um, okay, so we are considering uh, action controllable parametric timed uh, automata. So basically, it's timed automata. Does this work? Yeah. So in, in timed automata, you have locations. So, so here you have a source and a target. Um, you have the uh, real value clocked, so here you have X and uh, Y that are clocks there. 
Uh, they can be used in, in guards, so linear guards on transitions. So here it says that this transition from source to target, labeled by ACT, uh, is enabled if y, the clock Y minus the clock X is greater than 3. But they can also uh, be used in invariance on state. So here you have uh, something saying that in this state target, in this location target, uh, the clock Y must be less than 3. And there can be a reset on transitions. So for example, here you can self-loop on this source state and reset the clock X. The transitions are of two types. Uh, so there can be time steps where all clocks are uniformly incremented. So the time passes at the same rate for all clocks. So X and Y in this example will evolve the same way. Uh, there is no location change, so it's just the time passing in that case. Or there can be action transitions, and that is possible. So, the ex for example, this act is an action transition. Uh, if the guard is correct, is satisfied, and uh, the, then the clocks that are reset, are to be reset, are reset, and the, uh, we move to the target. So act moves from source to target. Here. And of course, uh, the invariance on uh, locations must not be violated at any time. So you can imagine, for example, if you are in this location target and uh, you can stay on the if y is smaller than 3. So if you want to let time pass, you can't let time pass uh, more than 3. Okay, so run there uh, would be the following. Initially we are uh, in the source state, so that is the initial uh, state. It's uh, indicated by this small arrow. And initially our two clocks, x and y, uh, have value 0. We can wait if we want three time units. So if we do so, we stay in the source state and both clocks are increased, incremented by 3. Uh, then, a possibility is to fight the loop and reset X, so this, this one. And then, in this case, we are still in the source state, because we loop on the source state, and clock X is reset to zero here. But clock Y is still three. We can uh, then fire this uh, transition act here, because uh, we are in the source state, y minus x, so 3 minus 0, is greater than or equal to 3, so the guard is satisfied. The invariant uh, at the end of the target state, y smaller than or equal to 3, is satisfied as well. And so we get to target state with 0 and 3 values. Okay. Um, so here we are, uh, so that was for time automata, and here we are concerned with action controllable, uh, uh, well, action parametric time automata. And uh, we have, uh, in addition to what I've shown you, we have parameters. So for example, here there's P, which was 3 in the previous slide. So we don't know what P is at the beginning. That is a parameter of the system. Uh, and so these parameters that can be used, uh, these timing parameters that can be used in the uh, linear uh, guards on transitions and in the invariance of locations. Uh, the action labels, such as uh, ACT here, they can be uh, treated as propositional variables. Um, so the, uh, the action and parameter evaluations then becomes something from the set of actions and the set of parameters to uh, the uh, evaluation which is Boolean for actions and real for the parameters. Okay. Um, so here, if we look at uh, uh, evaluation V in this uh, example, what happens? Uh, we, we would uh, look in this valuation for all transitions 
that are not enabled, so for which the valuation in force is false. That means that these actions can't be taken, they are controlled as not being possible, and then we can remove them, and we can substitute all parameters P with the valuation, the real valuation of P. So if we, uh, as an example, take this and say the valuation of act is true here, and the valuation of P is 3, well, what happens then is that we are in the previous case that I detailed earlier, and the target is reachable, that was the run that I described completely. Uh, if uh, we have still the action act and the valuation of P is 4, what happens is that target is not reachable anymore, because we can't, uh, we can't have y minus x greater than 4 and y smaller than 3 at the same time. And if the valuation of uh, act is false, that means that you can't take this transition and that the target is necessarily unreachable because there's no uh, arrow getting there. Okay. Uh, so, what we want to do is uh, to know the, uh, the reachability, uh, a parametric reachability in such a system. And so we want to understand, uh, uh, to find all valuations under which a goal is reachable from the initial state. Uh, there was a theorem um, many years ago by Allure and, uh, and his colleagues uh, that said uh, that this uh, problem is already undecidable for timed systems. So, uh, well, that is bad news, but um, the good news uh, is that for even for parametric timed automata, so without ac controlling actions, uh, you can sometimes build the results by uh, semi-algorithms, and uh, these results are obtained, these algorithms are such that if they uh, finish computing the result, then the result is exact. But it might be the case that they never terminate, so they would compute things. Uh, eventually, they will give you partial results along the way, and you know that in these cases, the reachability is insured, but you're not guaranteed to have all possible parameter valuations that give you the result. But in, well, in practice, it, it works quite well. Uh, we have uh, some tools. Uh, one of them is Imitator, that can unfold the zone graph to synthesize constraints on real parameters using linear operations, and which is uh, based on uh, polyhedral cal uh, calculus and it's dedicated to parametric time automata. And we could say, okay, let's use it and have a brute force approach and use uh, to synthesize action and parameter values. Um, we, we will iterate over all possible uh, subsets of actions. Well, as you can imagine, that is very, very costly and not feasible in practice. And so we want to avoid brute force. At the same time, we have another tool that is uh, called uh, Spatula, that was uh, developed by the Polish team uh, before this work. And it can synthesize uh, sets of actions uh, for fixed point properties of uh, crypto structures using BDDs, so it's a very efficient tool. And our idea was to mix uh, these two approaches to have imitator preparing the zone graph with the timing constraints and spatula synthesizing uh, minimal sets of actions for the reachability in the zone graph. So that's uh, uh, the idea. So basically what imitator uh, does is that uh, it will uh, find zones, so tuples where you have a location, so the state in the automata, and a convex constraint over the set of um, clocks and the set of parameters. 
and uh, it will build the uh, zone graph by using uh, civil operations which are uh, time elapsing, uh, resetting of clocks and projection of parameters. I won't go into mathematical details, uh, but just uh, give you an idea here. So let's take again this uh, example. Uh, we start in the, the source state and with a constraint C, and when we find uh, the action here, when we take this action, then we start saying, okay, we'll get to the target here, and we had our constraint C, the zone that was uh, on parameters and clocks. Um, it has to be satisfy the, uh, uh, the guard, so it will be intersected with the guard of the action, then we will reset the clocks, then uh, time can pass, and it must satisfy the invariant of the target. So basically, that, is, that are the operations at stake when uh, building the zone graph. So these operations uh, may be quite costly. Uh, in spatula, with uh, uh, action synthesis, uh, we, we, have, we start from a graph with zones as vertices and transitions labeled by actions. And then what we'll do is that we, we will uh, look for the actions, uh, the, the uh, reachable sets that are um, uh, sets of uh, zones that are with these actions. Okay, um, so this is uh, encoded uh, using Boolean expressions on the actions. And if we take again our thief example, and we have break glass, walk corridor, flyaway, and crawl vent as, uh, as uh, possible actions, then we can have a, um, a, a, a possibility that is a set of actions that include walk in the corridor and crawl in the ventilation, but not fly away. So that is uh, kind of the possible encodings that we, are, we can be using. So then uh, the reachability is uh, um, basically intersecting the, uh, the, the, the zone with the actions reachable in the graph. That goes to the goals. Um, so, this is done using uh, BDE-based fixed point uh, synthesis for, for uh, the existence of uh, the goal. And it's uh, expressed in parametric action uh, restricted CTL, so one kind of uh, uh, logics on actions uh, that is implemented in spatula. So to, f uh, to finish uh, uh, on the thief and treasure uh, example, so you see it's a bit more explicit than the one that was at the beginning. So here we have this clock Y that must be greater than P to break the glass, and then it's reset to zero, so it's, it's like a chronometer that counts the time that is passing in each action of the thief. And uh, then when the thief is inside, it walks the corridor, it counts at least two units of time, and then it's reset to zero, etc. And we have this uh, x here that is, must be less than 15, which is uh, counting the time for, since when the alarm started. Right? Uh, so we have uh, some actions that may be enabled or disabled, so breaking the glass, uh, crawling the ventilation, and flying away. And uh, the parameters are the crawl time here and the br glass breaking time here. When we construct the zone graph, we obtain something like this. And so you see there is in each uh, so in each, each state of this graph, we have a location and a constraint on the clocks and the parameters, right? Uh, and here, those that are highlighted are uh, those for which we reach safe. Then using this, uh, we can see what happens. So for the, uh, the minimal set of actions that must be enabled with the parametric, the corresponding parametric 
constraints. And so you can see different uh, corresponding uh, sets. And uh, this is, okay, and so you, if you don't have flyaway, for example, uh, and you want to, uh, to crawl the vent and walk the corridor, then the time to crawl the vent must be less than 15. And that kind of constraints. So we can synthesize these constraints uh, in the automatically. So this is uh, not brute force, and if you look at the uh, picture here, we have a comparison between this parameter synthesis and what happened on uh, a brute force on a more complex example. Thank you. <laughs> a rather naive question from the side of graph theory. If, if you could explain how could I understand this uh, cast in the language of, uh, let's say, simplest adjacency metrics where you can have self loops for X taken at points and then wait at the links for time taken for various steps. How, how does this? correspond to the spatula? Uh, okay, uh, um, well, uh, actually, what, so what we do is uh, build uh, hmm, a graph of all possible, of, of a describing the behavior of the system that includes some parameter constraints, right? And then the techniques that we developed are, are uh, basically exploring these graphs. So there are some things that might be uh, issued from graph theory, strongly connected components, and things like that. So and and search uh, um, in the graph search orders that might be important in the in the underlying techniques. Um. Other questions? And uh, uh, Theophil's uh, presentation tomorrow will uh, talk a bit about this, how can we reduce this graph and explore them in a, in a better way so that yeah, I, I have we a get question. I, I, I'm wondering, have you tried uh, using this approach to simulate or to represent a system which is of realistic size? I'm thinking, for instance, it looks very, much, very similar to things people might do in emergency management. Yeah. when you're moving people through a building, through a large building, or perhaps even in traffic control. Have yeah, you well, so the, the other example was, uh, well, was the classical train system, uh, train and co uh, gate controller system that has been modified so that it is both scalable to, to try different sizes uh, of the system and uh, also more complex how than big, the usual. How big? How many, how many trains? How many... Uh, uh, rail lines, how many? Uh well, uh, I, I mean, let me think. I, we scaled on the trains. Can't remember how many, up to Doesn't how many we how got. Many trains. Uh, but we scaled on the trains. We added some uh, intruder that could enable or disable some, uh, some sensors. So uh, that was the kind of scalability uh, things that we did. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. We just thank the speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Nicolas Gast. He's arriving, and I think his talk has just been put on on the machine, the computer. Okay. <coughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so thank you for the for the invitation and. Uh, Today, um, what I want to talk about uh, is uh, a model of, uh, of uh, 
say, uh, population uh, of uh, uh, stochastic population dynamics uh, that is called mean field approximation. And in particular, uh, I will try both to uh, explain you what it is, but also explain you uh, where it can be used and where it can be uh, what we call like refined, uh, in particular for uh, small populations. Um, so the general uh, model that I will uh, look at is uh, that you have a dynamical system where you have uh, a population of objects uh, that we assume that uh, d does not move, there is no arrival of objects, and each object has uh, its own uh, state, uh, like uh, that evolves in a discrete uh, uh, state space. And the uh, dynamic of these uh, objects are that, uh, were, I mean, if I look at one particular object, uh, uh, say I, it, um, I mean, it jumps to a st from state J I to state J with some uh, probability that depends on the population, on the, like, like the overall population uh, uh, dynamic here. And uh, in particular, um, here I'm writing like uh, xi would be the fraction of objects that are in a given state. Uh, so this is to represent maybe the, for example, the average uh, state of an object. And uh, here, um, my, I mean, the state of one object is like uh, uh, a mark of chain if you condition on, on this uh, capital X. So I jump to, from i to j with this uh, function q ij that depends on, on x. So I'll give an example more precise just, just after that. But uh, say that this kind of models uh, appears widely in like uh, game theory uh, when you look at uh, like replicator dynamics where an object tries to imitate uh, the best uh, behavior of people or in uh, biology uh, where you have a, a cell that is interacting with another uh, cell, for example. Or uh, my example would be in uh, computer systems when you look in particular at uh, decentralized uh, allocation strategies. So, in this talk, uh, I will talk about the general class of model, but uh, I will more spe specifically uh, use one example, that is the, the, the first uh, model, that is a, a so-called load balancing uh, example, where the idea is that, uh, imagine that you have a, a bunch of uh, uh, servers uh, that are represented as uh, queues here, and here, each of these uh, uh, black square is uh, one customer uh, in this queue. And uh, okay, each server is independent and serves its own customer. But what we do here is that when a, a client uh, or a, a job arrives in the system, what we do is that we sample a number of, of servers at random, and we allocate uh, th this uh, job to the least loaded of these servers. So for example, here I sample two queues, and I would allocate uh, the job to this queue that is empty, rather than to this one that has uh, three jobs. Okay, um, so this model is uh, uh, like a rather sim simple uh, population model, but it has, it has some kind of a complicated uh, dynamics. Um, and just as another example that uh, we'll see if I have time to describe it at the end, uh, this second, model is also uh, of the same street. It is an example of um, uh, infection propagation, where here, uh, you could imagine this is like some SIS or SIR example, where there are, uh, each agent has uh, different states, either it, like it, uh, it, it is infected, or here I call it uh, active, or it might be susceptible or, or dormant. And then, uh, depending on who he meets, who he encounters during the day, he might uh, jump from, say, for example, uh, uh, dormant to active or from state active to uh, susceptible again, okay? And uh, this kind of uh, like infection model are also quite uh, uh, popular in this uh, epidemiology uh, uh, literature. Um, so when you look at such a model, uh, maybe I, I'll jump directly to this thing. It's um, rather common to use two kinds of, uh, of models to describe the dynamics. Either uh, you use a stochastic model or you use more uh, dynamical system uh, approach and you write uh, directly the ODEs that correspond to, uh, uh, to this system. And uh, the mean field approximation essentially is the solution of this, uh, of this system of ODE uh, that you can write. And here, uh, what I want to talk about in this, uh, I mean, in this session is, um, now, if we go back to the stochastic system, uh, what does the ODE tell us about uh, our stochastic system? And in particular, 
what I mean, what is known is that uh, mean field approximation is uh, exact when the number of objects uh, goes to infinity. But what I want to uh, study a bit more is uh, what happens when uh, um, the number of objects is not uh, infinite, but, it, but it's uh, uh, moderate or even relatively small. Um, okay, and so this talk is really about uh, like how we can we use a dynamical system uh, approach to study uh, simple stochastic systems. No, it's not simple, but small stochastic system. Uh, so here's the outline. Uh, I first want to uh, give you uh, some uh, basics about mean field approximation, and then uh, we see how to become, uh, like, refine it to a small uh, population sizes. So, okay, so to go back on, uh, on my example, uh, here I'm assuming that I have uh, N servers, uh, jobs arrive are allocated to the shortest queue among uh, D queues uh, chosen at random. And uh, I'm assuming that the time it takes uh, to serve one server is exponentially distributed of mean uh, one uh, to simplify notation. So essentially in this model there are two parameters. Uh, one is a row, the, which is the load, which is the arrival, of, uh, uh, arrival at a given server. And the other one is uh, n, which is the number of, uh, of servers that I have in my system. Yeah, and uh, another one is D, but uh, okay, D, D will be considered fixed. Um, so the natural representation uh, of the state of the system would be to look at um, what I call uh, SN, which is the, the state of every object uh, in the queue. So here, uh, for this particular model, the first uh, server has one job, the second three, <laughs> one, zero, and two. So the natural representation of the state space uh, would be to consider this um, Tuple of variables. Now, um, of course, because I said that the, uh, all servers uh, are identical, this is not the most compact representation uh, of the of the system uh, state. And also, uh, it's uh, I mean, when n is large, when the number of servers is large, uh, this grows uh, exponentially. I mean, the number of possible states uh, grows large. So, like a more uh, uh, interesting, powerful representation is uh, to look at this uh, state capital X, where here Xi uh, would be the fraction of, of queues of servers that have I or more uh, jobs uh, in my queue. So of course, uh, X0 is one, because they all have uh, at least zero job. And uh, here for this particular state, uh, I have five servers, so X1 would be 0, 08, because like 80% of these uh, have one job or more and 40% uh, have uh, two jobs or more, and none of them have uh, four jobs or more, okay? Uh, so now this is a, an infinite uh, vector uh, in theory, but if, you, I mean, if the queues are, are, are bounded, uh, this, uh, this will be uh, finite. Um, now, when I look at this, uh, this uh, representation of the, of the state, uh, I can construct the, uh, the transition in, in my, uh, of my states. And there are two kinds of transition. Either I have an arrival of job or I have a departure of a job. And uh, here for this particular representation, if I have an arrival of jobs at a queue that has um, i minus one job, it will just increase the i coordinate by one over n because my x is a fraction of servers that have uh, i or more jobs. And a departure of a queue with i jobs will decrease this, uh, uh, this by one over n. Now, I said a departure, uh, departure occurs at rate uh, one for a server, so this is rather uh, simple, but the question is more like, uh, when I want to compute at which rate uh, arrive jobs, um, what is the probability that uh, when an arrival occurs, it is allocated to a server that has exactly uh, uh, i minus one jobs. Uh, said otherwise, like if you pick uh, two servers at random, what is the probability that the least loaded of these two has uh, exactly i minus one job? Uh, <coughs> easy question has an easy answer, but yes or no, it depends uh, if you uh, uh, pick the two servers uh, say with replacement or without replacement. Like it depends if you uh, want to pick two distinct uh, servers or not. Uh, if you pick uh, I mean servers with replacement, so if you don't uh, enforce 
yourself to pick them uh, uh, dis to distinct servers. Then uh, this parity is quite rather simple. It's just uh, x i minus one squared because this is a parity that when you pick a server it has i minus one drops or more and uh, minus x i squared. So this is a parity that the two servers have uh, both more than i minus one and not both have more than i. Now if you pick them with replacement it's a bit uh, more complicated but as you can imagine when n uh, is large uh, it doesn't make uh, really a difference. I mean, when n goes to infinity, uh, this thing converges to, uh, to this one. And that's why in, in the literature, I mean, most people uh, just focus on, on this, uh, this problem. <coughs> so to summarize the transition uh, on my system, uh, what I have is that uh, my uh, vector, infinite vector x, uh, like grows uh, uh, at, I mean, increases its i component by one over n at, uh, at rate, uh, at rate uh, n rho times this uh, polynomial, and it decreases at a rate um, n here that is linear because uh, here all servers are, are independent. And uh, what is called the mean field approximation of this system is just uh, the ODE that corresponds to these uh, average variations uh, uh, here. So in particular, uh, this is an infinite system of ODE, but uh, the, um, the derivative with respect to time of the i-th coordinate would be just a rho times this arrival here uh, minus uh, one times uh, this uh, this uh, this thing here. Okay. And um, more generally, uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, variant model of this system. Uh, I won't describe all details, but for example, uh, the variant of this system where when a server has no job, he, he will uh, pull uh, jobs from other servers. And this can again be described as a, as a variant of the model. Or you can imagine that you have uh, some kind of super server that uh, will go to the, I mean, for example, most loaded servers and will try to help them. And this can again uh, be modeled with such a, uh, such a model. And in all these systems, you can write a similar uh, system of ordinary differential equation uh, that has uh, more or less the same, the same form as before. And in fact, this model is just, not, not just for like this load balancing mechanism, but it's, a, uh, it's an instance of uh, models that are called like density dependent population processes uh, that have been, been introduced, uh, uh, let's say, in the, in the 70s, where uh, here I'm looking at stochastic model where I, X is, uh, imagine like the population, the number of, uh, of objects or the fraction of objects that are in, uh, in, in different states. And here, uh, the transition of the system are like x goes to x plus l over n at some rate uh, n times beta l of x, where l would be the, uh, my, my changes, like um, it just it says, for example, one, uh, one people from this state goes to, to this state. And, uh, and uh, here, this uh, n is the size of the population, so the, the thing that scales. And what we're assuming is that as the population grows, each transition affects a smaller number of people, but the rate at which uh, it occurs uh, grows uh, with the system size because more people are interacting. And for this system, uh, like the mean field approximation is just uh, the solution of this ODE, where the ODE is the average variation of the system, which essentially is the sum of uh, all transition of the, uh, uh, the delta of this transition times the rate of this uh, transition. Okay, so what is known for, for this uh, system essentially is that uh, as n goes to infinity, uh, a mean field approximation becomes uh, accurate. Okay, this can be uh, translated into a convergence in, in, in probability. And also, uh, similarly, like if the dynamical system has a unique uh, attractor, uh, not cycles or anything, but just a unique attractor, we can do the same convergence result for the uh, stationary uh, uh, behavior. And just to look at one numerical example uh, here, uh, what I draw in this table is that I pick different loads, different parameters of the system, and different system size. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, I compute like the uh, steady state average Q length predicted by my mean field approximation. And here I compute the steady state average Q length uh, using uh, uh, just a simulation of the stochastic system. 
And what you see is that uh, when n is about 100, uh, I mean, these, uh, these numbers here are like a good prediction of, uh, of uh, what happens for the real system. So it, it's given efficient uh, quantitative uh, tool uh, to study such systems. And uh, the model itself is not important, but just said if I took a variant of this model, I again have uh, something that is also quite accurate for n equals uh, 100. Um, okay, so more precisely, uh, where does this uh, 100 like uh, comes from? Uh, one partial answer uh, that uh, has been uh, has been uh, found is that if you look at population system, uh, like the most uh, simple approximation of a, a stochastic system is a deterministic uh, uh, system, and say the a bit more accurate approximation is to look at a second order uh, approximation, which is a diffusion approximation. And in particular, it can be shown that uh, if you look at my uh, stochastic process X, as N goes, goes to infinity, it is indeed uh, well described by some uh, uh, diffusion approximation that is uh, here my small X would be my uh, solution of my ODE, and the second term is a, a diffusion uh, a term. And that's what you uh, sort of observe here uh, on this curve, like my, the curve in blue is uh, the ODE. And then I put uh, three, four, three different sizes, like n equals 10, 100, and, and 1,000. And uh, you see that, first of all, the, the red curve uh, is roughly equal to the uh, blue curve uh, plus some uh, Brownian motion uh, around it. Okay. Um, and, but here, I mean, if you look at the green curve, it's, it's, it is pretty far away uh, from, the, uh, from the actual solution of the differential equation. Um, so why is, uh, I mean, why was the approximation really working for one, n equals 100? So in fact, if you look at uh, my average Q length, uh, still on my same uh, example, and you look at how, how does the average Q length uh, evolve with n, and here, particularly, I chose like n equals 10, 100, and 1,000. And this is the mean field approximation. So of course, you observe that this converges uh, uh, to this value. But also that the error that is uh, uh, when you, well, the error that's made when you uh, subtract this value minus uh, this value is roughly of the order, like uh, here it's roughly 4 divided by n. Okay. Uh, which is uh, not my 1 over square root n of, of just before. And in particular here, I mean, uh, I mean the orange curve seems uh, really, really far away from the blue curve, okay? Of course, it's just a discrete curve. Whereas here, maybe it's not, um, I mean, it is not close, but it's uh, not too far away. And in fact, this is uh, like a general result uh, that, uh, that you can prove is that if you look at uh, uh, here, an average Q length is an expectation of the system. An expectation of the system uh, is close to the mean field approximation, and the error, the error decreases like uh, 1 over n, uh, okay, as the system size grows. And uh, this is just like if h is a smooth function, expectation of h of xn is equal to h of x plus uh, a term v over n. And the nice thing is that this v over n is, uh, I mean, a solution of a differential equation also that uh, it is easily uh, characterized and that uh, it's easily, easy to compute uh, numerically. Uh, now, I won't uh, explain you really in details what you, I mean, how you compute uh, this v term, but just to say that essentially it, it depends on the first and second derivative of my uh, f function uh, before. And if you know how to compute the first and second derivative of, of your drift, then you know how to compute uh, this V. And uh, the differential equation is not really uh, pretty, but it's, again, easy to solve uh, with any uh, numerical library that, that knows how to integrate uh, differential equations. Now, if I go back uh, to my example, uh, okay, sorry, here I said that um, uh, the expectation of xn is equal to h x of a, x, uh, my mean field approximation, plus this, this term vt over n, plus I should have read it, there are some smaller order terms uh, after that. And this thing here, this x plus v over n, 
is, uh, I mean, what has been called this refine approximation because you refine the term by some uh, V over N. And now if you go back to my example and you look now, how does this refine approximation compare to the uh, like true value that we estimate by simulation? Uh, now, in fact, uh, so the first line here would be the value that I obtained by simulation. And the second, time, second line is uh, my fixed point plus uh, some term uh, V over N, where V here is roughly equal to, to 4 here. So my second term is like uh, this term plus 4 over N. And what you observe in this figure is that, in fact, it's uh, really a good approximation of, uh, of what happens uh, in reality. And here, uh, what you have to imagine is that to obtain this number for n equals 10, what, the, what we did is to, we look at the values uh, that is the limit as n goes to infinity. We look what is the rate of conversion to this value as n goes to infinity. And then you apply this correct, correction term here and here, and, uh, and it gives uh, a good, uh, good estimate of the I mean, give good estimate sorry, of, this, uh, of, of the value here, of the true value. Uh, but also it gives the estimate that it's much more accurate uh, than, than, than the uh, value that is provided by this uh, classical mean field approximation. Uh, similarly, if I look, this is just another example. Uh, here for n equals 10, we are really far away from this value, but uh, the refined approximation uh, gives a really good, uh, really good uh, quantitative, quantitative estimate of the performance. Okay, so um, to conclude, uh, what uh, I describe here in, in this talk, I, I, I talk about this uh, mean field approximation, that in fact, uh, mean field approximation can be viewed as um, an approximation where uh, for stochastic population process, where you assume that all uh, state of the agents are independent. And that's how you can construct also this, uh, this, this approximation. So if you look at this approximation, essentially what we need is that if we have some uh, smoothness, smoothness condition of the uh, differential equation, then uh, we have a uh, 1 over n accuracy of the, of the method. Uh, everything works well, and uh, we can use it to define a refined approximation. And in most of the cases that we've studied, uh, this works really well, even for population size uh, that are uh, pretty small. So essentially, it gives you really uh, uh, accurate numerical method to study quanti quantitatively uh, what happens for a stochastic population uh, process. Uh, so we can do it for yeah, st um, steady state analysis or also transient uh, regime, which is also convenient. And, uh, and we can do one over n term, but I mean the one over n squared uh, term can also be uh, computed even if it's a bit uh, more involved. Now, uh, of of course, I would say uh, this, this does not always, uh, always uh, work. Uh, one of the first limit of this is uh, that this works when you, when you want to uh, comp study properties that, that depend on the expected uh, value of the population. Okay? So if, for example, if you look at uh, a queuing system, uh, the average queue length is an expected um, it can be written as an expected value uh, of the population. But on the other hand, if you look at, first of all, what is the priority that my system has more than uh, 100 uh, jobs? This does not depend on the expectation of the q -lang. This is a really a priority of my population. So this is something that you cannot do. And the reason why is that uh, because the population uh, has a really stochastic behavior, and, uh, and, and so you cannot, I mean, there is this 1 over square root n times this uh, Brownian motion that you will, uh, you will find here, and you cannot go uh, away. Uh, a second limit is uh, more linked to a dynamical system uh, analysis. I mean, we, we've seen earlier that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, steady set analysis of dynamical system are, are really complex. Okay, and uh, in particular, it's quite common if you pick a random dynamical system that is, has a, a cycle, uh, cycle limits plus maybe some uh, points that are local attractor plus uh, some, I mean, all kinds of different behavior. And in particular, this, uh, I mean, this example here is just a, a two-dimensional dynamical system where there is a unique fixed point, but there is a, a, a cycle. 
And in fact, if you look at the trajectory of the dynamic system, they converge to the cycle uh, because the, um, uh, the trajectories go, go away from the, fi from the fixed point. Okay, the fixed point is not an attractor. And if you look at uh, this system, what is interesting is that just by modifying it just a bit the uh, parameter of the, of the differential equation, uh, the fixed point can be an attractor or can, can be, uh, uh, I mean, can be, I mean, can repulse the, the trajectories. And now if you look at the, what's, what uh, gives the mean field approximation of this system, then in fact you realize that the mean field approximation is not really working well because it predicts a cycle where uh, simulation, I mean, where the stochastic system, uh, its particular Markov chain always converges to its uh, stationary measure. And if you look at the refined expansion, uh, it gives like all sort of uh, uh, crazy, uh, crazy dynamics uh, that, that essentially says that uh, it's not just numerical instability, just really the, the method is unstable when you have this uh, kind of limiting cycles. Um, okay, last thing uh, that I would just want to mention, uh, mean field approximation nowadays is also quite popular uh, because of mean field games and games theory. Uh, and there is some connection between what I've said and, ga and mean field games, but it's uh, not completely uh, obvious uh, that a game with n player always converge to a game, uh, I mean, to a mean field game. In particular, it, it's not, not always old. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, questions? Yes, Gerardo. Go ahead. Oh, you need the mic. Uh, nice talk. Um, concerning the transient distributions, um, you know, there is a famous paper by Shrikant analyzing a specific family of models, peer to peer systems, where he used the central limit theorem for the, the, the diffusion approximation. Um, in your experience, uh, correcting, adding the, the diffusion term, don't you get already a nice approximation of the transient or doesn't always work for small t, for instance? So I think it depends what you, uh, I mean, it depends again what you want to, uh, what you want to track. Uh, like, like here on the, on the left, uh, this is really um, like, like the stochastic trajectory are really close to the, um, uh, to the, uh, sorry, uh, to the, the mean field approximation plus this uh, diffusion uh, approximation uh, that, that you can put on. And so if you want to study the, the population uh, dynamic, this uh, capital X, then it, it really works uh, well to have this uh, diffusion approximation. Now, um, what this, uh, I mean, this diffusion approximation, what it does not give you is, uh, for example, when you want to study uh, how does the, um, how to say, how does the expected, for example, Q length evolve with time? So you want to remove, essentially, if you want to remove this, uh, the noise that you have in, in your simulation, now if you take the expecta expectation of this, uh, of this term here, uh, it's clear that the G uh, is centered, so the G goes away. And so it's not precise enough to give you the, uh, a better estimate than just uh, this approximation. Okay. And that's where you need uh, the second term, essentially, is a 1 over n right. that, that, that comes here. May I ask you, in your simulations, what kind of distributions are you assuming for the arrivals and for the services? OK, say that uh, for now, the only thing that I know how to do uh, is uh, exponential distribution, so Poisson arrivals and uh, exponential service time. Of course, if you have uh, like phase type, uh, it would be doable too. Uh, but like more general distribution than that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, okay, but that's why you're getting these good approximations. Uh, if you move away from those assumptions, then we're back perhaps of a question uh, that Gerardo was asking, uh, how to approximate when you don't have exponentials. Uh, see, that, that's, that's a challenge, I think. I mean, that's uh, what he was pointing to in a certain way. Uh, yeah. I assume that you are using exponentials. Mm -hmm. I kind of understood that. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm the next.
next one. I'm the next speaker, so that's easy. Uh, let me just say a few words of introduction, as I, not of myself, but of the work, uh, as I uh, start my presentation. Uh, the work is, um, um, strangely enough, not the, my most recent work. So a lot of my recent papers, you can look, for instance, at the journal of IEEE Systems Journal, uh, they're about uh, energy issues. Uh, or I have other work, energy and ICT, energy and computing, and I have other work, also recent work, on, on IC information, you know, networks and computers, and security. So those are the areas in which I've been publishing recently. Uh, however, uh, this work I'm talking about because it hasn't picked, been picked up as much. For instance, if I were going to talk about energy packet networks, no point in doing that. Jean-Michel will talk about such things later. So I'd rather talk about something uh, that uh, has perhaps been less picked up. Uh, the uh, only uh, people who've picked up on this work uh, over the years are, well, one of my students got a PhD, and because of the subject he worked on, he got a very nice job at Zurich Re. Uh, you know, that's also an interesting application of a PhD, getting a nice job. And uh, then people at Tsinghua University have expressed interest and have worked on this, on related problems. And people in Hungary, some information theorists in Hungary, have worked uh, on, on, this, on these models. Okay? But other than that, it hasn't been picked up. So I'm kind of talking about it now, so perhaps someone else will pick it up and do something with it. Okay? So it's about net networked auctions. And the base paper is quite old. It's 10 years old. So it's an ACM transactions on internet technology. And the AC, why that journal? Because the ACM transactions on internet technology uh, did a lot, published a lot of papers and still does on mechanisms and auctions. So on economic models applied to computing issues. So economic paradigms applied to computing issues. So that's why I had published it there. And recently, uh, there have been these transaction papers and some conference papers and so on on taking this approach to represent auctions in telecommunications. As you know, in telecoms, there are different kinds of auctions. The most common one is where they auction actually bandwidth, uh, when they sell bandwidth and they set up auctions, but we're not talking about that. Uh, the applications here are about uh, the following question. Suppose that many telecom users have a contract with their internet service provider or their mobile service provider saying you have so much bandwidth. Okay? And this bandwidth, say they have so much bandwidth per month. So they've paid to get, I don't know how many gigawatts, giga, I didn't mean WATT, I meant giga WHAT, some unit. Okay, so uh, they've paid to get so many gigabytes or whatever of bandwidth. And um, as the month goes by, so they have this at the beginning of the month, it's been renewed. And as the months go by, uh, the month goes, goes by, they either are very close to exhausting it using all of it, or they have not used it. Okay, so uh, the applications here are about how you can use auctions so that those who have excess bandwidth can dynamically, automatically sell bandwidth to those who have not enough, okay? So that the ones who have excess can recoup some of their money, and the other ones would, of course, pay something to this individual uh, who is giving them bandwidth, okay? So that's the application, and the whole issue is how to model, analytically, how to model auctions. Now, when I started this work, and I need to, uh, when I started this work, my motivation wasn't that. My motivation was much simpler. Let's see which button I push. Um, it was that the world is going towards a system of electronic transactions. Okay? So a lot of the things that we're doing, for instance, in uh, finance and so on, we're doing automatic transactions. And uh, therefore, it would be very interesting to be able to uh, model economic transactions using analytical techniques. So let's go forward. Uh, uh, 
a little bit with the, uh, uh, with the background. So uh, at that time, when I got into this problem, at that time, uh, I was working on, with people um, like Nick Jennings, who was at that time at Southampton, who is a kind of a big auctions and mechanisms person. And I was trying to understand what was actually happening. Because if you look at the literature in this field, uh, the literature is essentially simulation. So you have a very hard time understanding or reproducing, if you wish, uh, the results they're claiming or understanding how they have reached these results because it's all based, I've done this, I've done this, here's, here's the mechanism, and here is the simulation result telling you that this is working or it's not working. So that was the, um, <clears throat> uh, that was the, uh, the motivation. It was really to build some math underpinning the way these mechanisms were being represented, okay? So uh, we have to have a, f a certain number of quantities that we define. Uh, we are talking, you can think, let's start with a single auction. I will then go on to N auctions operating together. But let's start with a single auction. Now, in a single auction, uh, first of all, uh, there's the value of the good. The value means how much it is worth to the buyer. Okay, uh, the, that, that value can be a random variable. Okay, we assume it's a random variable. This uh, value, of course, will evolve with time, but let us assume that it's a stationary, that's uh, a time-independent random variable. Uh, the uh, buyers, obviously, will not bid above the value. So if they know that this is worth 100 euros, they will not easily pay 101, 102, and so on. But you may have a certain bidding probability associated with the value of the good. The other aspect which is very interesting is that the seller, okay, in all auction systems, the seller has to at some point either decide that it has received a better bid and therefore the previous bid is out of the picture or it has to answer the buyer by a deadline. Okay, so the model also has a deadline, which again can be taken to be a random variable. Uh, then there's the issue of the price. So what is the price? The price is a random variable as well, but this is a dynamical system now, if you think about the price, because the price is evolving with time. How does it evolve? Every time there's a new bid that comes in, this bid is of course above or equal to the previous price, okay? So uh, the, it's an increasing function, th this random variable representing the price is a, an increasing function over the lifetime of a single auction, okay? And when the auction is over, what does, what happens? When the auction is over, the price drops to zero because you're starting a new auction. You can make various changes on this basic model. For instance, you can consider that there's a reserve price, that is, you will never sell unless the bids exceed a certain value, okay? But that's kind of a detail in the context of a mathematical model. So I won't go through the whole history of, of, of uh, these things, but uh, try to show you what it looks like. So uh, the simplest model you can imagine is a Markov chain, okay? The Markov chain has, um, uh, it represents what? First of all, it represents uh, the uh, price going up, and when the sale, occur sale occurs, the price drops, drops to zero. Okay? After the price drops to zero, you will have a dead time when the whole auction resets itself, and then this is repeated as a renewal process. All right? Then you have bids which are arriving, and you could assume that bids arrive according to a Poisson process. Why not? It's a good starting point. So bids arrive at a, a, according to a Poisson process, and the, uh, uh, the, the bid arrival rate can be modulated by the value compared to the price. So if the value is way higher than the price, the arrival rate might be at that time a bit higher. The value below the price, then this would change. Okay? So you can have that, and then if you analyze things, you get some very nice, uh, you get some very, very nice results uh, in the model, very simple results, very clear results. Uh, for instance, 
the expected sale price given a value uh, has the following form that you see there. I don't know if the pointer works. I suppose it does. No, it doesn't. Um, okay. So what you're seeing there is 1 minus rho to the power v over 1 minus rho, where rho is the ratio of the arrival rate to the arrival rate plus the delta is the acceptance rate. Okay, 1 over delta is the average time it takes the seller to accept the bid. Right? Of course, any bid will be superseded by a higher bid. So you have this very simple representation, the sale price and the income per unit time okay, that you can get. And this characterizes uh, the behavior of, um, of, the, uh, of the auction, of the single auction by itself. These are results coming out of a fairly simple uh, Markov chain model. Uh, there they are summarized. Uh, in this form, uh, the expected income per unit time. Now, you have a detail, Vickery auction. Now, the model I described with, you know, uh, a bid comes if it's higher than the previous bid, uh, then the previous bid is annulled and the process continues and the uh, seller has a fixed timeout if it doesn't receive a better bid, has to sell to the highest bidder. This model is known as an English auction. Uh, there are many variants, and there are uh, variants called, um, for instance, the Vickery auction, uh, uh, where the highest bidder gets the object that he's trying to buy at the second highest price, not at the highest price, the second highest, because you say, we will sell it to you at the price that someone else is bidding. Okay? So in that case, uh, you will have uh, a different formula. But basically, it's all kind of the same thing. So from here, uh, auctions with a minimum sale price, I mentioned that. It can be S. This is a, called a reserve price in an auction. Uh, then there are questions of, suppose a bidder is unsuccessful. Um, what is the probability that it, that it comes back? Uh, what is the effect of this on the model? Okay, and that's uh, what's discussed there. And this is kind of the numerics, which is, which is interesting. Uh, the D there is in fact delta, the D along the x-axis is delta, and uh, the um, y-axis is the income per unit time. Why do I say income per unit time? Because if you're a seller, um, you are not really interested in the price that you get for one bid, because you're also optimizing time. You are interested in how much money you're making over time not how much money you're making over individual auction, because you could wait indefinitely, hoping to get a very, very high price, and you would perhaps get a very high price, but by that time, you would have wasted a lot of time. Uh, so you're interested in the throughput of the economics transaction. If you're running, for instance, a website selling, uh, I don't know, uh, washing machines or something, you're interested in the throughput of this website in terms of money per unit time, not in the highest money you've gotten for a dishwasher. So you're looking at that, and it's quite interesting that for the seller, there is a parameter of optimization, which is how long she should wait before accepting the bid. Okay? So if you are to the left-hand side, it means that your time is very long. Okay? Uh, left-hand side, the time of waiting is very long, and what's happening is uh, the price, I mean the income per unit time is very low. You're waiting a lot, hoping for a high price, but you're not making any money. And at the right-hand side, uh, when you go to the right-hand side, then it's, you're deciding very quickly. Uh, and between the two, there is an optimum. Okay? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, more about various things, uh, curves of this type, uh, the effect of distributions uh, regarding uh, the value, V, Okay, the small v is the value. You can assume it has a certain distribution or another one. How robust are results to the different distributions? Uh, the difference between an English and a Vickery auction, and so on. So you can, you can keep on doing this. The effect of the probability that the uh, buyer comes back uh, and how that influences your income. You know, if you have persistent buyers who are happy and they're coming back, obviously you're going to make more and more money. Uh, so all those things can be analyzed in this model, okay? Uh, let me move on now 
uh, there are quite interesting things about price formations. Uh, I won't talk about them, but basically what you have are bidders who are observing the auction in which they're going to buy. Okay? So by observing the auction, they have a sense of what the value is. So if they do some kind of optimization to understand this, then you will have fixed point equations describing uh, what the buyer knows and its arrival rate and what the market is doing or the auction is doing in response to this. And that gives you some rather neat results. But uh, we'll just skip all that because I actually want to go to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, networked auctions. Okay? I'm skipping a lot of things and going to network auctions. Now, what's a networked au auction? And there's an interesting, what the main bottom line is that the network auction will have a very nice product form result solution, okay? uh, which is different from Jackson Networks, different from uh, BCMP Networks, different from the product form solution. So uh, what does the system look like? Well, now, each auction is represented by two integers. One integer is the price at that auction. Okay? What is the current price at the auction, so that you have to bid above that price to be able to buy. The second integer is the number of buyers sitting at that auction. Okay? So the uh, auction is the price and the number of people sitting there. Okay? And these people, the assumption is, if someone is sitting at one can't be sitting at another auction. So you have a motion of buyers who go from one auction to the other in the market, Okay? They have different places where they can buy something, so they will move around, perhaps as a function of price, a function of other things. So they're allowed to move around, and the motion is a Markov chain. So all of this model is Markovian, everything is Poisson, everything is exponential. So they're allowed to move around, and every one of these auctions has different parameters. For instance, it's different. Okay? And the arrival rate of buyers to that particular market will be different, that particular auction will be different from the arrival rate, the net arrival rate of, of uh, 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 customers at the other auction. So you have this kind of very interesting model. It's a mobile bidder model. So you move around as a function of your interests. And uh, you have um, external arrival rates for each of the auctions. Uh, of course, you're going to have flow equations, which represent the total arrival rates, because some people will leave one auction to move to another one. Then you have uh, the departure rate, uh, which will depend on these two variables, y and x, that I mentioned. Now, uh, the departure rate for an auction will depend on uh, the number of people sitting there, except yourself, uh, except, uh, so you'll, you'll have a, a departure rate, and then you'll have some other uh, quantity uh, which is a basic uh, uh, parameter of the, uh, of, of, of the system. So you're going to have individual departure rates. Uh, you're going to have different values of the goods. Okay? Uh, so you have all of these things mixed up into uh, this representation. So look at the departure rate, for instance. It depends on uh, the number of uh, customers, minus one. Why minus one? Because the one who has just bid is stuck there until it is taken. That person is not going to leave, okay? Stuck there, so you have y minus one. Then you have some local constant, beta, and then you have a term which depends on the price. So people will leave an auction if it's just too, too expensive. So you're going to have a rate of departure which will depend both on the number of people sitting there, on local parameters, and also on the price. So these are interesting uh, ways of representing uh, the system. Now this leads now, uh, of course, differential equations are not in mean field approximations. The differential equations are also the Chapman Golgorov equations. So we have the, uh, the differential equations representing uh, the, uh, these, n, these n auctions with two integers for each auction, uh, the price and the number of people sitting there. Um, and uh, you have state transitions, and you can enumerate the state transitions. And um, you, then you can compute, uh, build marginal equations uh, for numbers of bidders. Uh, there is one basic assumption under which uh, the, uh, uh, the um, 
uh, model is being solved. And this is the so-called active bidder's assumption. What's the active bidder's assumption? It says that, as, uh, that uh, if there is a, a, a single bidder sitting there, then if, there's a single, if the number of bidders is at least one, okay, then the price is also at least one. It means that if a bidder arrives to, a, to an auction okay, and finds no one, immediately, and the price is zero, immediately, okay, it will make a bid saying this is kind of very cheap. I, 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 I'm not going to look at the window. I'm there to buy. So if I see the price is really zero, then I will immediately bid. And the, so you have an immediate transition into the one state. So that's the, just the single assumption uh, that limits, if you wish, the model. And with this, uh, one has basically a product form. And the way you solve it is that you first solve uh, the marginal equations uh, related to the number. You look at the steady state related to the number. And then from there, you go back into the joint probabilities and you solve the joint uh, probability distribution. So that's really uh, all I wanted to say. There's a lot more uh, to be uh, said about the subject, but it's kind of interesting. And I hope it raises some uh, interest uh, among some of the researchers and students sitting here. And I I'm ready to answer questions. Let me go back to the, any questions? Yes. Well, the simplest case is that they have some arbitrary uh, Markov chain representing the movement of bidders. Okay? The departure, though, is state dependent. Right? So you depart because uh, the price is too high or whatever. So you have a state dependent departure dep depending on the price. Okay? Now, you can also get a product form if you assume that the arrivals are state dependent, dependent on the price. So that's basically the model, the, 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 uh, which means that you still have, uh, you, you, you then in that case, you will have uh, state-dependent transition probabilities from one place to another, okay? And you'd have state-dependent, of course, departure probabilities from any state. Uh, both are possible. So decide to, uh, wants to continue and buy other things, free to do so, uh, may go to somewhere else, or may depart the system. Yes? Well, it depends. Uh, if I'm buying something, uh, say if I'm buying a car and I'm looking at different auctions, I can't buy five cars at the same time. I have so much money and I buy one car. So I concentrate on one auction, put my attention there and so on. So it really depends on what model you're looking at. The case where you try to buy many things at the same time, uh, I, have, um, I can't think of many practical situations where that would happen. Uh, uh, I can't really think of, you know, but there are, I'm sure that you can, you can imagine situations. No, not at all, because bandwidth is one user selling bandwidth, okay, so many users selling bandwidth, and many buying. But they buy one at a time. They don't, they're not going to say, I buy three from you, five from you, seven from you, etc. They buy one at a time, and they try to get what they need. If, when they need again, they will try again, or if they don't have enough, it will go again. So it's, you know, the, the individual, I, the idea is that the individual decides on a purchase one at a time, not simultaneous purchases. It would be kind of even very difficult to do any optimization, even, f you know, you're going to have NP hard problems of optimization algorithms and so on. Yes? Then 
becomes unmeasurable to be there, and beings at infinity. There's a huge sort of difference, which practically cannot be outbid. Immediately secures the price of the previous leader. How can you uh, sort of protect yourself? Well, you can, uh, the uh, formulas I gave you are for the case. Uh, I mean, this is a mathematical model, so everything is not included. But uh, the formulas I've, I've given you is where bidders are incremental. That is, if I have given a bid, uh, and I, what do I do? I look at, if I'm going to give a bid, I look at the other guy, and I bid just above, hoping to get it. Okay, so it's a kind of a unit, unit increment type thing. In, in, in the analytical models. But you can have jumps. You have a random variable which represents the jump, which is, in that case, equivalent, essentially, to that model. Now, your case is where the random variable has you know, a very large uh, distance between you have two values, you know, or a group of low values, and then the exceptional values once in a while. And one could analyze this. expert of uh, auctions but so th the, there is a there is often a game theoretic aspect in it that users at a given auction uh, interact in a strategic way so here they interact in a stochastic way which is this uh, you look at the how many people there are and you you look at the current uh, price or whatever and then there is a random process of the but so could, could you incorporate this strategic aspect between uh, in, in your model yeah well, we did actually, I, 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 we, uh, uh, but that was in the case of a single auction. So in a single auction, we looked at many strategic cases like that. And this is what got my student the position at Zurich Re. Uh, <laughs> quickly after his PhD, got a very high paying job way above my salary. Uh, but so we did look, but for a single auction, when you're in the network case, which in a way is more interesting, uh, it becomes very difficult to uh, do any analysis and to get any results, at least for me. Other questions? questions. Yes, sir. Uh, quite often in the situations like bandwidth, the value, the value is connected with the timing. So I need bandwidth from, say, tomorrow to day after tomorrow, or tickets for the theater performance. Right. So therefore, the value of the, uh, the value of the of the bidding part is declining when the deadline comes, because of course you cannot buy the ticket when the performance started or is going on. Yeah. The same story in bandwidth. Did you take that into account? That well, this yes, is because the transaction doesn't happen unless it's available immediately, yes. right? So this is exactly the assumption. So that you bid, and at that time you get it if it's there. If it's not there, you're not getting it. So that's the assumption that we made in the two papers that I mentioned about uh, uh, network bandwidths. But from the seller point of view, it also underlines this element of potential. The seller has to take into account the way to long. Right. That over the month, you know, as, as he gets very close to the end of the month, right. uh, the fact that he has extra bandwidth is worthless. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Other questions? Well, thank you very much. It arrives r at the right time. I was actually watching the buffet over there uh, to time myself. As the doors opened, I said, I have to finish. <laughs> thank you.